And he said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Grant that these two, two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left hand, in your kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We just appreciate this time that we can share with you again. And as, uh, as this request of the sons that may sit on your right and your left, we ask that all your sons and daughters be able to sit with you in the heavenly realms to understand your good and pleasing will and how much you love them, so much so that you sacrificed your own life for their freedom as a remission of sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right, let's have a look at Matthew. We start in the book of Matthew and we look at Matthew chapter 20, verses 22 to 28. There's a lesson here. There's a lesson here that uh, models what Jesus did. And also how we can come into new life serving God, coming into his uh, eternal covenantal love for us. Knowing that it's the greatness in serving. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with their sons kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand side and the other on the left, in your kingdom. But then Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by the Father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the other brothers, the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so amongst you, but whoever desires to become great amongst you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. And just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. A ransom is a word while Strong's Accordance 3083 from the verb luo to loose. The word signifies a release from slavery or captivity brought about by the payment of a price. Sin demands an exp exp expiation, an atonement, a price paid because of the penalty of death that was upon us. But Jesus' gift is to us, was himself a universal ransom for many that was of a, a vicarious nature. And Lutron defines the price paid, cancelling our debt. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your birds, Lord. Sacrifice and service is a kingdom dynamic, and this is part of the reconciliation. Jesus squarely confronts the world's concept that greatness is defined by the high position. But true greatness in God's kingdom comes through sacrificial service. As Jesus chose to be a servant, reconciling us to God, the one true living God, he put on human flesh, he washed the disciples' feet, and then sacrificed his life, paying the ransom for us. But service and sacrifice are two essential elements of godly reconciliation. As agents of reconciliation, we learn that humble service offered in obedience to God and love for others is a powerful way for the walls of alienation to be broken down between us. The measure, of, the measure for success for children of God is not in how we rule, but in how we serve. This is true servanthood. This is another great kingdom dynamic that we can appreciate. Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness leads to servanthood, for Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. See the Savior takes the towel and washes his disciples' feet, then hear him say that his disciples are called to do the same. The character of the faithful servant reveals devotion to the interests of others 
the, thoughtful, the thoughtfulness of rendering untiring care, the delight in the prosperity, the honor, the happiness of someone besides oneself. A dramatic model of this is the bondservant of the Old Testament as found in Exodus chapter 21 verses 1 to 6. Serving wholly for love rather than accepting the privilege of his own freedom. Servanthood is not slavery. It is voluntarily. Mot motivated from within by the love of God. Not mandated by the style, insistence or manipulation of subject uh, subjugation, pressures or guilts or even demands. It is not cultish but Christ-likeness. Always in the spirit of him who, being endowed with heaven's complete authority, chose to take the form of a servant. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 7 speaks of the humbled and the exalted Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. It's a great kingdom dynamic, leadership traits and Christ-likeness, humility. Human perspectives on humility distort the idea often humbling people by loveless actions that rob them of dignity and nobility. But Christ-like humility is manifested in the freedom of God's Son to affirm the fullness of all God has placed in Him without needing to flaunt or to prove or even to push it through self-advancement. Jesus' complete absence of any need to clutch for power or attention is manifested in humility. It is the royal spirit that is the king of heaven himself displayed in servant-like graciousness. Just as Christ's humility received ultimate exaltation, so our call to humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up, points to the way for the rise of God's highest purpose in each and every single one of us. Humbling ourselves opens us up to the increased grace and childlikeness is the doorway to this dynamism of kingdom come in our life and in service. What a wonderful thing to do when we come into the kingdom of God is letting go of the old, the grave clothes that uh, Lazarus had. Holding on to the new that will allow us to have eternal life in Christ Jesus and to be able to do great exploits, missions, serving, giving us the heart after God, Father God, His Son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Going back to Matthew chapter 20 verses 29 to 34, it speaks of two blind men receive their sight and I just pray that this will touch the hearts, the minds and the spirits of those who hear this message. Because there's a message in parables. Now they went out of Jericho, and a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they had heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. And so Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, that our ears may be open. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. When the Lord speaks to us, and I'm going to have to be a Peter myself right now um, after this message, but um, we don't know the day or the hour, but he may come back now. Now. But with salvation and deliverance comes a new life in eternity. But it's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, but no other God but God. Allows for him to be able to do maybe what we can't do. 
And if your eyes have been blind for the eternal things, this is an opportunity to give Him your, your heart and your life right now. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you speak to this person who's hearing this message and just flow your Holy Spirit in and amongst their hearts, in their minds and in their spirits, so that they can truly comprehend and appreciate that this is eternal life that's available. But Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. You know, the son of David occurs twice in verses 30, indicating that men were rendering to Jesus their messianic title. But note something here. How Jesus, serving, in asking the servant question, which is a great leader trait, how can I help? What do you want me to do for you? This is finding out what the need is, the spiritual need is. And sometimes we may present a physical need, but it's actually a spiritual need that we need. That, 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 that's at healing opportunities. But what was Jesus' response here? Compassion and healing. And because of that, they followed. Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 25 speaks of Jesus' authority that is questioned. Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he saw teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism. The baptism of John. Where was it from? Was it from heaven? Or from man? And they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And Jesus speaks a parable of judgment. Uh, repentant sinners of the vilest kind would enter the kingdom of heaven, but not the religious pretenders. Hmm. Probably a timely message. John chapter 4 verses 1 to 3 speaks of a Samaritan woman who met, meets her Messiah. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and parted, departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. And then it goes on to talk about something that we'll read in a second because it's about sensitivity and the kingdom of uh, God and uh, the a great kingdom dynamic that we can appreciate through a reconciliation. And Jesus' sense of constraint, which is the needed, and choice to travel through Samaria, an area shunned by the Jews, demonstrates great intentionality in reaching out with the reconciling love. He reached out with a divine love and a human sensitivity to a woman who was of a different race and whose morals were questionable. This consistent with Jesus' frequent reachings, breaking the mold of the tradition, traditional religious, he became a friend of the tax collectors and generally sinful who were not only loathed by the supposedly righteous, but were thought to be unworthy of attention. And Jesus gave time and energy to relationships which sometimes meant experiencing pain as well as loss. But in John chapter 4 verses 4 to 9, he provides yet another life quality for us to emulate. He calls us to enter intentionally and sensitively into the experiences of other brothers and sisters in Christ, even if they are different from us culturally, ethnically, or even denominationally.
So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sechar, near the plot uh, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob was well there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by a wall. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. When the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, asking a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. By Jews reckoning the sixth hour was about noon, but by Roman authorities or reckoning it was about 6 a.m. or 6 p.m. And John exerts an exp uh, explanatory note about the hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans and um, who are of mixed race. The result of the Syrians intermarrying with Jesus who had stayed behind on the northern territory following... Sorry, behind... Uh, sorry. The result of the Syrians intermarrying with Jews who had stayed behind on the northern territory following Israel's demise. Jews didn't have dealings with the Samaritans, but it didn't mean that they didn't share commerce with the Samaritans. Rather, the Jews did not share eating or drinking vessels with them. Then it went on to say, Jesus answered and said to him, verses 10, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give them will become in them a fountain of living, springing up water into everlasting life. Eternal life is a personal choice. And we can choose to follow or we can choose not to follow. But the result will be in one direction or the other. And when you come into the kingdom of God, there's a transformation process happens. There's a shift that happens. All of a sudden you start seeing things from above and not on the earth. And sometimes the family members may not truly appreciate or comprehend the, the value of this but as once we were sinners and unbelievers who came believing believers the same applies for those loved ones family members even friends or communities remembering that it's the reconciliation of the ministry of God that allows them to come in and grow into what God has called them to be not by power, not by might, but by the Lord's Holy Spirit. So with that we give the time and the space for them to grow into what Christ has, uh, has done for them. But there will come division, as Christ warned in Luke chapter 12, verses 49 to 53. You know, some commentators feel that the fire symbolizes the divisive nature of Christ's ministry consuming the destructible and purifying the indestructible. What was Jesus' wish that the fire was already kindled meant to mean? What, did it, what was it supposed to reference? His death as a prerequisite to the fire's appearing better understood the reference to the burning zeal of believers connected to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit.
So we've touched on the water baptism. And now we're looking at the um, Holy Spirit baptism. And in Acts chapter 2, it speaks of the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Let's read a word wealth. One accord. Strong's Accordance, 3661. Being uh, anonymous, having mutual consent and being in agreement, having group unity, having one mind and one purpose. The disciples had an intellectual anonymity, an emotional rapport, a violational agreement in the newly founded church. In each of its occurrences, Homo Thumadon showed a harmony leading to action. Remember I've spoken previously about taking those steps of faith, just like they had to do with the coming of the Holy Spirit. We read verses 2 to 4, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues, as of fire, and one sat upon another, each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. The rushing wind suggests mighty but unseen power of the Holy Spirit. But that spirit of baptism, Holy Spirit baptism, would be accompanied by wind and fire. But remember the burning bush, representing His divine presence. And sometimes there will be a response, because the tongues of fire that John the Baptist was for telling how the spirit baptism would be accompanied by the wind and fire. And the allusion to the burning bush, the symbol of divine presence. This outward manifestation of the spirit's coming was another sign of his power and his Holy Spirit that he draws all unto himself. And then a little later on, there was a response by the crowd. And in Acts chapter 2 verses 5 onwards it says they were dwelling and and they were and they were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews devout men from every nation under heaven and when the sound occurred and the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speaking in their own language then they were all amazed and marveled saying to one another look are not all these who speak Galileans and how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born. And Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. And Phagia and Familia in Egypt and those parts of Libya joining Serene visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues and the wonderful works of God. The wonderful works of God is something great. Uh, Strong's Accordance 3167. Conspicuous, conspicuous, magnificent, splendid, majestic, sublime, grand, beautiful, excellent, favorable. Used here and in Luke chapter 1 verses 49, the amazed visitors at Pentecost heard the disciples in their own languages reciting the sublime greatness of God and his mighty deeds. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we give you thanks for this message about your kingdom, your servant heart, as well as the greatness in what you did to serve. Lord, I ask that you continue to open the eyes of those who have yet to know the true revelation of your kingdom. But more importantly, Lord, we ask that the baptism of the Holy Spirit will come upon each and every single hearer of this message. As the Samaritan woman met her Messiah, we ask that all those meet you too and understand and appreciate and comprehend the sensitivity and reconciliation that you have for them coming back into your covenantal love. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit amongst the nations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.